Today I'm going to explain elementary school addition, multiplication, and division in this lecture on digital building blocks. This lecture will cover the design of some basic digital building blocks. Let's start with arithmetic and return to the topic of fixed point arithmetic and the fixed point data type which I briefly covered when discussing the Project 2 requirements in which we asked you to write a RISC-V program that would use fixed point multiplication to perform divide by 10 and modulo by 10 operations. A fixed point number is a value with an assumed power of 2 scaling factor. For example, if we have an 8-bit fixed point value and we decide to make the lower 4 bits fractional bits, that is, we assume that the rightmost four bits are to the right of the decimal point, although technically it would be radix point, then the value stored is being implicitly scaled by two to the power of negative four, or one sixteenth. If the eight bit value contains the binary value 32, which is zero zero one zero, 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 then we must treat it as representing the value of 32 times 1 over 16, or the value of 2. Or if the value contains the binary value of 33, then we have to treat it as representing the value of 33 times 1 16th, or 2.0625. This way, bit 0 carries a weight of 2 to the negative 4th power, or 1 16th, which is 0 0.0625. And then bit 1 carries a weight of 2 to the negative 3rd power, or 1 8th. Uh, bit 2 carries a weight of 2 to the negative 2nd power, or 1 4th, all the way to bit 7, the leftmost bit which carries a weight of 2 raised to the power of 7 minus 4, or 2 to the third power, or 8. Assuming that the value is unsigned, uh, if it's a signed value, then the most significant bit would be the signed bit. For signed fixed point values, you would use 2's complement, in which the negated form of the value, or the 2's complement, would be obtained by complementing all of the bits and adding one to the least significant bit position, which in the case of fixed point numbers, doesn't carry a weight of one as it would with integers, but instead carries a weight of two to the negative f power where f is the number of fractional bits. So in this example, that would be two to the negative fourth power or one sixteenth. So this way, with two's complement, the range of the values that you can represent are two raised to the power of n minus f minus one, where n is the number of bits and f is the number of fractional bits, uh, to 2 raised to the power of n minus f minus 1, and then minus 2 raised to the negative f, which in this case, the range would be negative 4 on the low end to 3.9375 on the high end. Now, it's 0.9375, because on the high end we're subtracting 1 16th, which is uh, point 0 0.0625. You can add and subtract fixed point values the same as you would integers, meaning that you use a normal integer add and subtract instructions or normal integer add and subtract hardware, but the software when it's doing fixed point addition and subtraction, it must ensure that the values that you're adding have the same number of fractional bits. If not, then it needs to first shift the value that has, that's the fixed point num a value with the greater number of fractional bits to the right uh, before adding or subtracting in order to align the decimal points in the, in the two numbers. In other words, you only want to add or subtract two fixed point numbers that have the same number of fractional bits, and if they don't, you need to adjust one of the values 
so you can ensure that they do before you add or subtract. And speaking of adding and subtracting, let's talk about adders. Hopefully you remember from 211, uh, CSE 211, that adders are built from full adder elements, which are single bit adders that add two single bit inputs, as well as a single bit carry in, and they produce a single bit sum and a single bit carry out value. In essence, the full adder accepts and adds up three bits, which produces a two bit output in the range of zero to three, or, or zero, zero to one, one in binary, and associates the most significant bit of, the, of this two bit value as the, uh, as the carry out and the least significant bit as the sum. So for example, if you add uh, one, one, and one, you get three, which is one and one. The sum would be one, and the carryout would be one. A full adder can be built as a simple circuit, which has a propagation delay of a single three input XOR gate, or the combined delay of a two input AND gate and a three input OR gate, whichever one of those delays is, is greater, obviously would be the critical path. When using full adders to build a multi-bit adder, you connect the A input of the full adder, which assuming that we call the inputs A and B, to each one of the bits of one of the two add-ins or operands, the two values you're adding, and then you connect the B input of each of the full adders to each of the bits in the other operand or other addend. So this way, each pair of bits representing each bit position or each uh, level of signif significance in both operands are associated with one full adder. And in, in this arrangement, each full adder is called a column. All adders have this part in common, the idea of connecting the pairs of bits into full adders. The carry in, on the other hand, is problematic due to it potentially requiring too much propagation delay. And different adder designs take different approaches for trading off the long propagation delays in exchange for higher resource usage. So in other words, there are different adders uh, that trade off their speed with their cost in terms of the resources. So first we'll examine the ripple carry adder, which is the simplest design in which the carry in input to each full adder is connected to the carry out of the full adder associated with the column to its right. The problem with this approach is that the propagation delay of a ripple carry adder is n times the propagation delay of the full adder where n is the width of the operands being added. And this is because the, you, you can think of it as the, is, is kind of ending with the leftmost bit, leftmost column, the most significant, uh, full adder is taking its carry in from the full adder to its right and then that full adder is taking its carry in from the full adder to its right and so on eventually requiring a signal to propagate through all of the full adders to complete the add operation essentially from the the top level carry in the carry in into bit zero column zero all the way to the carry out of bit n minus one, or the most significant bit. Now the carry look ahead adder addresses this problem by designing a faster block of logic that computes the carry in of an arbitrary bit or arbitrary column without relying on any of the carry ins except uh, for the carry-in into column zero, which is the top level carry-in. To do this, the, the carry look-ahead adder 
adds two additional outputs from each full adder. So normally when you think of full adder, you think of sum and carry out, but the carry look at adder adds this notion of the generate and the propagate output, which can be, which can be output from each full adder. The generate signal is asserted when the two input bits for the column, A and B, will are set such that they will result in a carry out regardless of that column's carry in. When does that happen? Uh, well, that only happens when A and B are one, right? When A and B are one, you're guaranteed to carry out no matter what the carry in is. In other words, the carry, in order to get a carry out, the sum has to be at least two and you can, you, you, you're guaranteed to have at least two if A and B are both one. The propagate is asserted when the carry out for a column would be the same as the carry in. And that would happen if A or B is set to one. So if you're getting a sum of at least one resulting from just the A and B inputs, then you'll get a carry out, but only if the carry in is one. So the propagate signal indicates that a carry in would be propagated through that column, through that, for that full adder to the carry out. So it makes sense, right? In other words, stated again, if, if both input bits into a column are one, then that column is guaranteed uh, to carry out, to have a carry out. And so that's the generate signal. And if one of the inputs, A and B inputs, is one, then the column will have a carry out only if there's a carry in into that same column. And so this is the propagate signal. This is what the propagate signal means. So the, so the generate is A sub I and B sub I. The propagate is A sub I or B sub I, where I is the, is the column number. We can generate the carry into column I by using the generate and propagate signals from the columns to its right, so columns I minus one down to zero. If the column to the immediate right is, has a generate signal, then we're guaranteed to have a carry in to column I. But if the column to the immediate right has a propagate, but then also the column to its immediate right has a generate, then we will have a carry in. Or if both columns to the immediate right both have propagates and the third column to the right has a generate, then we will have a carry in. This pattern continues until we reach the carry in to column zero, which is the top level carry in to the whole adder. The, the problem with this approach is that the number of terms and the number of gate inputs for the resulting expression grows for each full adder as you move to the left. So for example, the carry in for column three would be this, and the carry in for column four would be this. To control the growth of the carry in logic, we can compute generate and propagate signals for groups of columns by using the generate and propagate signals for the single columns within the group. And this way we can generate a generate and propagate signal for the whole group. Kind of like basically we're doing this hierarchically now. We've got individual generate and propagate signals for individual columns and then we can combine these together for a group level generate and propagate. And using these group level generate and propagates, we can, we can compute the carry in to the next group to the left, which is the same as carry out for the current group. So in other words, we, we, within each group, we calculate the group level carry out and we use that for the carry in for the next group to the left. The propagate signal for columns three down to zero for example, is obtained by just anding together the propagates from columns three down to zero. Since all the column propagate signals must be set uh, to one in order to propagate a carry in from bit th 
zero all the way out of bit three, or column zero all the way out of column three. The generate signal for columns three down to zero is a sum of terms where each term includes the generate signal from the adjacent columns and did with the propagates to its left. So you start out with generate two and propagate three, and then you have generate one and propagate two and propagate three, and then generate zero and propagate one and propagate two and propagate three. Use the group generating propagate signals for, for each of the groups to then compute the carry out for the group. And then of course that would be used for the carry in for the next group to the left. To do this, there is a very simple logic expression. The carry out is the carry in anded with the group propagate or with the group generate. The important thing to, to understand about this scheme is that the group generate and propagate signals are calculated with a constant propagation delay for each group of four columns, but the carry out signal depends also on the carry in signal from the previous group, which means that this carry out signal's propagation delay is still scaling up with wider adders, but it's scaling up relative to the number of groups. But it's only actually adding two gates of propagation delay for each group because the group level generate and propagate logic is effectively being performed concurrently uh, with, with, the, with the propagation of the carry-ins. So in terms of the scalability of the delay, you're adding two gate, two gate delays or two uh, propag gate propagations for each group in this scheme. So to summarize this design, the columns are grouped into groups of K, K full ladders. Each group is comprised of, full, of K full adders uh, using a ripple carrier arrangement internally, as well as the, the logic to compute the column generate and column propagate signals, as well as the logic to compute the, the group generate and propagate signals, as well as finally the logic to combine the group generate and propagate signals with the carry with the uh, carry in uh, from the previous group of K columns. So I, I refer to this delay as the and or delay. It's, it is the, it is the, defines the, the way the propagation delay scales as you add groups. For each group you add, you have to, you have to propagate through just an and and or gate within each group. To generalize this delay, the carry lookahead adder for n groups with a group size of k will require a delay to generate the column generate and propagate signals plus the time required to generate the group generate and propagate signals plus the and or delay multiplied by the number of groups minus one. Finally, then the amount of time needed to perform the ripple carry for the full adders within a group, since the ripple carry process in the leftmost group can't begin until the all the care group level carry-ins are, are compute, computed, but most importantly, the most significant carry-in. So, as the most significant, the leftmost group carry-in, or you know, comes into the the leftmost most significant group. After that happens, you can then finally start the ripple carry of the group within the group. 
The prefix adder is a third adder design that uses a strategy to further reduce the propagation delay of the adder. Instead of relying on previously computed carry-ins to compute each carry-out, the prefix adder uses a different approach where it doesn't use carry-ins at all. <laughs> Instead, it, it only uses generate and propagate signals. The carry-in into column zero, which is the top level carry-in, is, is really the only carry-in that's used. And it's, it's actually renamed in the prefix adder as being generate sub negative one, G negative one. So it's the generate from column negative one. The prefix adder computes the generate and propagates for all the columns as before, that's no different, from n minus two to zero. Uh, so for a 16-bit adder, we're, we're computing 14 of these GNPs. And then if, as I mentioned, there's also a uh, G, um, negative one, which is the top level carry in. Prefix adder computes G and P's for all columns uh, from N minus two to zero. So for a 16 bit adder, it would compute 14 of these G and P pairs in addition to uh, G negative one, which is the top level carry in. After this, each pair of consecutive generate and propagate signals are combined into two column GP groups using the logic the generate of the group is equal to the generate of the upper or the propagate of the upper anded with the generate of the lower. And the propagate of the group is the propagate of the upper anded with the propagate of the lower. Now Keep in mind that when I say upper and lower, I'm talking about the bits, uh, the, two, the two halves, the, the, the ranges of the, the columns of the two halves that are being combined. Okay, now they don't have to be the same number of bits. So initially we combine each pair of G and P's uh, this way. So for a 16-bit adder, this will produce eight GP group signals. From these, larger groups are formed consisting of that, 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 that result in group sizes of three and four bits. For example, generate bits 14 down to 13, which we merged in the last step, are combined with generate bits 12 down to 11, which we also created in the last step. We combine them to form a four column group which is going to be generate bits 14 down to 11. But, so in other words, we take you know, two pairs of uh, bits and, and combine them into four bits. But also, we can also uh, combine bits G13 and G12 down to 11 to form a three column group, G13 down to 11. So in that case, we're combining a one bit generate with a two bit generate to get a three bit generate. In other words, one column G and P signals are first combined to create two column groups using eight merging operations in this case for a 16 bit adder. Then we take two and one column groups and combine them to form four and three column groups using another eight merging operations. And then in the next step, we take our four, three, two, and one column groups and combine them together to form eight, seven, six, and five group uh, G and P groups using another eight merging operations. Finally, the eight through one bit groups are combined to form 15 uh, down to nine bit groupings. At this point, you have a G signal that covers a group 
starting from each of the columns and then spanning the bits all the way down to negative one. So, you know, we have uh, 14 down to negative one, 13 down to negative one, 12 down to negative one, and so on. Which, once you have that, then those, those values are directly used as the carry-in for each full adder, for each of those full adders. And since there's no need for the full for each of the full adders to generate a carry out because you know what's the point at this point we don't need to generate carry outs from the full adders because we're calculating all of the carry ins for each bit separately then the full adder itself really only needs to uh, compute the sum bit and uh, it, it, so in, in that case the full adder is really just becomes an XOR gate that XORs a, B, and carry in. The propagation delay of the prefix adder is thus the delay uh, needed to generate the single bit G and P signals plus the delay to generate the groupings. The, the number of groupings you pass through through the critical path is log base 2 of N. So we went through, we had 16 bits, we went through four stages of, of, of merging so then uh, so we were multiplying log base 2 of n times the need to perform one of these merging operations now once that's done you still have to then go through a single XOR gate for the for the uh, the the full adder so comparing the propagation delays of each of these three adders if we assume that the two input gate delay is 100 picoseconds and the full adder delay is 300 picoseconds then for a 32-bit adder it would require 9.6 nanoseconds for the ripple carry adder 3.3 nanoseconds for the carry look ahead adder with the four bit groups and 1.2 nanoseconds for the prefix adder so the prefix adder is eight times faster than the ripple carry adder and and that's a difference uh, between uh, being able to run your CPU at, at uh, 104 megahertz when using the Ripple carry adder uh, to running it at 833 megahertz for using the prefix adder, of course, assuming that the adder is the critical path for the whole CPU. And once you have an adder, you can build a subtractor by adding logic that allows for the B input into the adder to be complemented if you're doing a subtraction and also if you're doing a subtraction you would also set the top level carry in or the carry in into bit column 0 to 1 so you know that would basically do the 2's complement of B you would be negating or sorry complementing all of the bits of B and then adding a 1 through the carry in input and this would con convert B to its negative form and thus it would subtract A minus B how about building a comparator which tests if two input values are equal? Well, I would subtract the two values and check to see if their difference is zero, in which case they're equal. Uh, but that's not how the textbook says to do it. Uh, it. The textbook says to perform an XNOR between each pair of the bits of both values and then feed the results into a, uh, a, 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 a large... AND gate, an AND gate that has a fan in of 32 or, or however many bits our comparator is, is um, or, or how many bits our operands uh, are. And I guess this works too. My approach requires an N bit OR gate uh, in order to check to see if the result of the subtract is zero, while this approach requires an N, N bit AND gate but my approach allows us to reuse the subtractor which we would already need in order to support adds and subtracts while the books approach requires the addition of the array of x nor gates and x nor gates which is okay uh, if your cpu would would need to be able to perform a subtract in parallel with a comparison although you know in the risk 5 processor it doesn't re doesn't require this, at least in the case of doing an in-order single-issue uh, CPU, you know, one instruction per at a time. Uh, the book, however, does suggest using a subtractor 
when comparing two values to determine if one value is less than the other, in which case you would subtract and check to see if the sine bit of the difference is one, meaning that the difference is negative. Now, let's shift gears and talk about the shifter. Ha! A barrel shifter, which can shift an input value an arbitrary number of bits within one cycle, uh, is, at least to me, a surprisingly expensive piece of hardware. Fundamentally, uh, a barrel shifter requires an equal number of muxes to the number of bits of the value that is to be shifted with each mux having a number of inputs also equaling this number. So in other words, the barrel shifter is n muxes with n inputs, which means that the, the, the circuit is growing uh, at a factor of n squared, almost like a, like a crossbar switch. And, and this is even, this is only for shifting in one direction. In this example, we have a four bit shifter with a two bit shift amount. The shift amount is used to control all of the muxes, which contain hardwired zeros for the inputs corresponding to the shifted in bits. So for example, if the shift amount is three, the top three muxes will output zero and the bottom mux will output a bit three the leftmost bit of A. A shift register, on the other hand, is different from a barrel shifter. A shift register is a register having a, a control signal um, that allows you to either load the shift register like a regular register or to shift its contents one bit in, in a cycle. Shift registers can be loaded in parallel and um, as I mentioned, and the bits can be shifted out of the shift register one at a time. So shift registers are used for parallel to serial converters. And if you have a shift register where you can shift bits into, then they can be used for serial to parallel converters as well. Shift registers are, are, are actually much simpler than a barrel shifter because a shift register is just an array of flip-flops with each flip-flops D input uh, d driven by a MUX that accepts either uh, a parallel load, like just an input bit, or the, the output of the flip-flop to, to its right, its neighbor. Remember from CSE 212 that a left shift operation multiplies a value by two to the power of the shift amount, and a right shift operation divides a value uh, by two to the power of the shift amount and then you know rounding down. Uh, what if we want to multiply or divide a number that's not a power of two? We go back to elementary school. <laughs> we remember that in base 10, uh, we, we, when multiplying large numbers, we multiply the multiplicand, which is the first operand, the first value, uh, by a uh, single digit of the multiplier, which is the second operand. And then we add up the products that we get from this, or sometimes they're called partial products because you add up these values and you get the final product. Um, you, uh, you, before you add though, the partial products, you have to shift each of the partial products to the left by uh, a number of digits that represents the position of the multiplier digit that, that produced it. So in binary, we use the same trick. If we multiply five by seven, for instance, this would require adding three copies of the multiplicand, which is five, for each of the one bits set in seven. So there are three of them, seven is one, one, one. But we shift each one of, each one of the uh, multiplicands by uh, the, the bit position for each of the one in the multiplier. So uh, because the seven is one, 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 that's bits two, one, and zero. So we would shift five by uh, zero bits, one bit, and two bits. So this would be basically like we'd have to add up three partial products, which would be five, not shifted, 10 shifted by one, and 20 shifted by two. So you add a five plus 10 plus 20, and that equals 35, which is five by seven. So a hardware multiplier uh, must contain an adder for each bit in the multiplier, minus one, because the, the, the first two partial products can, can share, share one adder. 
uh, the rest of the the adders have to have to accept the previous addition from the previous adders one of the inputs and then the other input would be the next column in this example we have a four bit multiplier which requires three adders uh, the second operand the multiplier is being fed into an AND gate along with each bit of the multiplicand. This um, effectively zeroes out the multiplicand, um, the shifted version of the multiplicand for each of the zero bits in the multiplier. The uh, structure of the multiplier matches the, 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 matches the long form multiply that you would learn in elementary school. Notice that the carryouts of the adders in uh, one row feed into the next row below it. Um, you can speed up this arrangement by arranging the adders in a tree based on the observation that only the middle n bits in the addition of all the partial products need to travel through all of the n adders. So that's the critical path. Um, okay, so finally, we will end this lecture by talking about the most complex of all the arithmetic circuits, at least in my teaching experience, which is the divider. The divide operation is so expensive that the 32-bit ARM instruction set architecture doesn't even have an instruction for divide. They're like, nope, <laughs> you want to divide, you have to do it in software. Uh, and when I tried to add the divide instruction to this course, when I was designing the reference CPU for this course, the divider basically ate up all the resources on the entire FPGA just for the one operation in order to do in, a, in that case I was trying to do the divide in one cycle which is uh, is the reason why it was so expensive because I, I didn't want to create multi-cycle uh, functional units in, in the CPU for the class students in 611 and even you know back in my CSE 212 course are um, usually kind of intimidated by the divide implementation. They're afraid of the divide. But uh, being that it's almost Halloween, let's do something scary and talk about divide. A divide operation divides a dividend by a divisor and produces a two outputs, the quotient and the remainder. Computers usually perform an n-bit divide by shifting the divisor to the left relative to the dividend. And, it, and it initially it does that by n bits and then it subtracts the shifted divisor from the dividend. Now you can keep in mind though that you can shift the divisor to the left uh, relative to the dividend or um, uh, you can shift the dividend to the right relative to the divisor. Uh, but basically, this, this, the idea is that you're taking the divisor and you're making it uh, bigger than it actually is by shifting it to the left relative to the dividend and you subtract. If the result is less than zero, it, uh, the, the subtraction needs to be undone. It needs to be reverted or restored. So we get the original version of the, of the dividend back. Um, and then it will take the, the divisor, shift it to the, to the right to, to make it a little smaller. And then it puts a zero into bit position N of the quotient. Um, and then it decrements N. Uh, and then it tries the process again. Uh, however, if the result from the subtract was non-negative, it makes the dividend adopt the difference. So the dividend is no longer the dividend, it sort of becomes the kind of the running value which eventually will become the remainder after everything is said and done. So this is generally referred to as the remainder register, this, this dividend as it gets kind of whittled down. Uh, and if that happens it will put a one in bit position end of the quotient and then try again. 
Uh, and this is repeated n times, where n, in this case, n is the original uh, width of the divider. The final value of the dividend, as I mentioned, becomes the remainder. This is uh, relatively easy to do in multiple cycles, which, and because, uh, in fact, in my 212 course, the, the students um, had, to, had to write kind of a, a program to do this in multiple sequential steps. But how do we do it in one cycle or as a pipeline in hardware? Uh, well, you start with an n by n array of full adders. Starting from the top row of the adders, um, for the, the A input, you feed in the dividend uh, shifted n minus 1 bits to the right. So you're shifting the dividend to the right instead of the quotient to the left. Um, and then, uh, it, which basically puts in, you know, n minus 1 zeros and, and then concatenated with the most significant bit of the dividend. So that's one of the inputs of the adder. That's the A input. And then for the B input, you feed in the complemented form of the divisor. Uh, and then you set the top level carry in to 1. So you're making a subtractor. The result of this addition is muxed before sending it to the next row, such that the mux allows you to choose whether you want to pass down the unaltered value of A, which was the, um, the remember A was the dividend or the actually the uh, remainder register, or you can pass down to the next row the difference from the adders. Um, so you would, you would make that decision whether uh, if, the, if the difference was negative, you would just pass down the original values there. Uh, and if it was non-negative, you would, you would pass down the, the result of the subtraction. The output uh, of the muxes, though, and this is the neat part. I think this is kind of cool. The muxes are actually, they don't go straight down to the row below it. They get shifted to the left as they pass down. So every, as you go from one row to the next, you, you shift the output of the row uh, to the left as it goes down. Um, and the most significant bit of the dividend is, uh, is shifted into the right-hand side at the same time. So you're, you're doing this shift as you go down, shift to the left. Uh, on each row, there's a, a bit, an output bit, that indicates whether the subtract yielded a negative value. Um, how do we know this? Well, we just, you know, we look at the carryout from the addition. If the carryout is zero, then that means that we got an, uh, an underflow. We, we have a negative uh, result from this un unsigned uh, subtraction. Uh, this is where I think there's actually a bug in the schematic the book has, since the output quotient bits um, would not need to be complemented so that the little uh, inverters there I, I don't believe are necessary if you're connecting those directly to the carryout of the most significant adder. Uh, but that's not a big deal. The point is is that if, if you end up uh, taking the subtraction, applying the subtraction, and not restoring the subtraction, then you, you put a 1 into the quotient bit. Uh, and the output of the final row that comes out the bottom of the array is the remainder. So that is all I have for digital building blocks. Um, we hope you, I hope you weren't too intimidated by the divider. And uh, for that matter, Happy Halloween. That's all we have for today. Thank you.